All right. Looks like we're getting a decent number of people on, so we can go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody, uh, to today's webinar. This is the next in our, our latest in our series of OIE uh, upgrade webinars. Um, for today's presentation, we're going to be focusing on devices primarily. Uh, we have myself. Uh, my name is Brent Arrington. I'm a member of the product acceleration team here at Okta, focusing on OIE. And I'm happy to be joined today by my colleagues, John Kokinius, also from the product acceleration team, and Dimitri Volkman from our product marketing team, also both focusing on OIE. We'll be running today's presentation. And as I mentioned, uh, in addition, we're joined by some other OIE experts on the call who will be monitoring the Q&A section of the webinar. So uh, please take advantage of that and we can get your questions answered in real time. Before we begin, this is our ubiquitous safe harbor disclaimer. This presentation will contain some forward-looking statements, so just throw that out there. And in today's presentation, we're going to guide you through a journey from Okta Classic through the self-service upgrade process to finally uh, taking advantage of a rich set of features that empowers you to create sophisticated device context-aware policies. Next slide, please. Uh, so for today, as I mentioned, it's going to be all about devices and specifically how can we get smarter about the devices that our end users are using to authenticate. But that's where Okta Identity Engine comes into play. Uh, OIE is a free full platform upgrade that delivers both enhanced security as well as improved user experience. Among other things, OIE can accelerate, accelerate the implementation of passwordless flows, zero trust use cases, and also provides greater flexibility and scalability uh, in creating secure identity flows. Now, these use cases are supported by the following features, just to name a few. Uh, phishing resistance, advanced device context, which we'll see more of on today's call, assurance levels and app level policies, no password or optional password policy capabilities, flexible account recovery options, customization and branding options, and additional developer resources. And coming soon, uh, we'll also have available desktop MFA through a, a product called Okta Device Access. So keep an eye out for that as well. All this new innovation is available to you once you upgrade to OIE. And now to take a look at some of the fundamental differences between Classic Engine and Okta Identity Engine, I'm going to turn it over to Dimitri. Thank you, Brent. And uh, hello, everyone. It is now my turn to welcome you to this uh, webinar meetup and uh, illustrate some of our aspects of uh, our journey from Octa Classic to devices. Now, OI is our latest upgrade and brings new concept. So we're going to discuss uh, specifically a new authentication pipeline, new framework, uh, uh, policy framework, and much more. All our customers since March 2022 run on OIE, the new customers. So uh, there are more than 6,000 of them, and it's, uh, it's a very proven upgrade. Uh, so let's look at some of the, the key concepts in OIE that are, that are slightly different from one you, you guys are used to is classic. The first thing to uh, look at is uh, authenticators. So authenticators are what the end users will use to authentify. Authenticators have authentication method of certain factor types. OIE supports a number of authenticators. You have a few uh, listed on the, on the slide here, and you can add more as well. So rather than trying to explain into details, let's take some practical example of, of authenticators. So the most classic one is probably obviously the password, a secret string of characters, which is a knowledge factor type. And uh, it is something that you, you know. A second type of second authenticator is a phone. And it's different in the sense that it is a possession factor. This is something that you own. And it's also interesting to note that a phone has a two authentication method, SMS and voice. Now, finally, the, the, the most sophisticated type of authenticators are usually materials in form of apps, such as Okta Verify or Google Authenticator. Okta Verify is interesting in the sense that it is a possession factor because it's an app you're running on your phone, but it can also leverage biometric on that device. So it's a multi-factor type authenticator. So you can also see in the slide that the, the, the authenticators can be set up for being used for authentication of, or recovery. So central part of, uh, of OIE, uh, the authenticators. Second thing that is new is the policy framework uh, in OIE. 
And uh, in classic, you have a, a, a password policy and a related sign-on and apps that also have their sign-on policies. OIS strengthens this framework and, and takes a more structured, I would say, an abstract approach. Now, first of all, whenever a user presents itself to OIE, it goes through the global uh, session policy, which is on the left of the screen. In the global session policy, you can do similar thing that you were doing in the in Okta sign-on, like require a password or an authenticator sequencing. But what is new is you can also defer actually authentication to the app level policy. So you can basically say, do nothing, go look at the app level policy. The app level policy is now on the right side. And uh, it is important to understand that app level policy, one app level policy can be applied to several uh, different uh, applications. And uh, you will see that in the uh, must authenticate ways, you do not require a specific authentication method or a specific factor sequence, but you require an outcome. So in this case, we say, well, we want a password and another factor. And you have a number of options and choices here. You can require just a possession factor, or you can require any factor type, any two factor type. So you describe at a more abstract level the, the security outcome you want for the authentication process. Now, OIE will very conveniently present in the in the bottom part under the, the, the section on authenticate with which authenticator that have been provisioned in your enterprise satisfy uh, these conditions. So in our cases, it's obviously a password. And then you can use email or Google Authenticator or Cloud Verify, phone or, or Fido, Fido too. So the concept of the policy framework is uh, more structured and, uh, and more abstract. And that's uh, an important part of, um, of OIE, obviously. Now, the other important concept, which I'm not going to spend too much time here, uh, because this is really the, 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 the whole story about this webinar, but in OIE, in, uh, sorry, in Classic, you're probably familiar with device trust. So in OIE, this is replaced and augmented by device, what we call device context. And uh, we're going to walk you through the different capabilities, but there are multiple. You have device assurance policies. You have integration with MDM and security tool. You have device registration, and then you can put all this together into a what we call device context aware policies. So sophisticated policies that can really leverage the context of the device. Now, finally, how do you put all this uh, together uh, with OIE? Um, so this new policy framework allows you to really focus on what we call assurance level. So a common way to leverage that is to create buckets for your different applications. So in this matrix, which is an example, it's not a reference architecture. You, you will obviously have to tailor this to your specific needs, but you will see that the columns are the different levels. So we have a low, medium, and high level here. The first line is the type of application. The second line is the device context that is required. The third line is the authentication uh, uh, requirement or, or level that we, that we want. And the white boxes are given illustration. So let's have a brief look on that. For low assurance level applications, such as the dashboard or, or lunch selection, for this one, we'll say, well, any device can access this application and we only require any one factor type. So example could be a password or an OTP. For medium assurance, collaboration apps, basic business apps, we require a registered device with Octa Verify installed, and we require a possession and knowledge factor type. So in this case, that would be satisfied by a password and an OTP uh, or push notification on, on your on your Octa Verify. Finally, for the highest level of assurance, financial apps, uh, intellectual property, uh, trade secrets, business critical application. In this case, we, register, we require the device not only to be registered, but also managed by an MDM solution. And here we require either a possession of knowledge factor type and biometrics, so an inherence factor type. So for the ultimate level of security, and this will be uh, satisfied by uh, Octa Verify with FastPass, our own solution, but can also be satisfied with uh, WebAuthn uh, on a device that has biometrics. So this is how you do the simple, I would say, the top level concept uh, for OIE. Now, OIE comes with a bunch of new features. We're not going to cover them all, obviously, today. We are going to focus on, uh, on, on devices here. So device context, but also app level policy and phishing resistance will be mentioned. As an administrator, you actually also want to explore the management SDK and Terraform support, uh, which is a, a significant upgrade to what you can do in terms of automation. And obviously, our passwordless experience, for which we had a webinar meetup uh, last month on this specific topic. And if you missed this one, it's available on our uh, YouTube channel. 
Now, before we dive in into a device context, I want to give you a very brief uh, before after view of uh, two organizations. So we created a simple demo arc that we cloned with two user groups and two users and two apps. So using the uh, simple the simple org that we created, um, and uh, as I explained, we created two copies uh, and we upgraded one to I to OAE. I, I want to show you an illustration of uh, some of the concept uh, we've uh, we've just discussed as the the fundamentals of OAE. So let me quit uh, Chrome here. First, I'm going to go into um, the Okta Classic org. So uh, I'm logged in as an admin, and you can see that there is a banner here that is uh, proposing to schedule the upgrade. Um, nothing interesting to discuss in details in the dashboard. In the directory, uh, as we said on the slide, uh, we have uh, a couple of people who have been uh, created uh, alongside with us as the demo, uh, the demo team here, Nancy and James. Uh, we also have a group, a couple of groups, so the basic users and the advanced users. Um, so very, very simple. Now, if we go into security, um, obviously, uh, as being a, a seasoned uh, Okta Classic admins, uh, you know that in authentication, this is where we have the password policy and we have our sign-on policies. So we've created two sign-on policies for our respective groups. So the basic users who have a very simple rule that just require a password and uh, the uh, advanced user who actually require the uh, end user to use a factor sequence. Now, let me uh, pause here and, uh, and, and make a few comments about factor sequencing. Now, not all of our customers use factor sequencing. Um, this is a, a, an additional features you can use in which you can specify a specific sequence of factors that the end user has to go through. If you use factor sequencing, you will find them back in OIE after the upgrade. If you never use factor sequencing, uh, don't even know what it is, you will never find it in OIE. So in all cases, uh, you should not really worry about it. Uh, if you're used to it, it's there. If you're not used to it, it won't be there. The reason for not putting in by default is because given the way the application level policy are constructed uh, with an abstract level, it doesn't really, it isn't really relevant to use factor sequencing in OIE because you really specify the outcome you want and OIE automatically figure out the right sequence based on the authenticators you have. So, but we will see what happens if you have factor sequencing and upgrade uh, in this scenario. Uh, multi-factor is in OIE where you find the different, what we now call, sorry, in classic, multi-factor is where you find what we now call the authenticators. So Okta Verify, SMS authentication and Google authenticators, which are the ones that have been uh, selected here. And, um, if you go into uh, now the applications, you can see that we have two demo applications, Wikipedia and uh, Business Insider, uh, which are bookmark apps, and they both have their own um, sign-on policy. Uh, this one requires multi-factor, uh, pretty straightforward here. So that's what we have in Classic. The last thing I want to mention here, which is specifically relevant to today's webinar, is if you go into the security device trust, which is what you could do around device in Okta Classic, uh, you can see that we do have Windows device trust enabled here. So we will see how this is upgraded in the um, in the OIE org. So this is our classic org. Now, if we switch to OIE, there's a, and we look at the directory. So first of all, uh, once you've upgraded the org, you will see this banner here that said that your upgrade was completed. Um, now in the directory section, we're going to find the same thing, the people, the same people we have, uh, we had here. There's actually an additional person that we added post upgrade for the demo. So don't worry about that. Uh, same thing for the groups. You'll find the different groups, advanced users and basic users here. Now there's a new uh, menu choice here on directory, which uh, um, uh, John and Brent will talk about later on is the devices. So here we can see the registered devices and we will explain this concept later on. Now, if you remember uh, my introduction about the new concept, um, in OIE, you have a concept of authenticators. So authenticators are listed here. So you can see that password is listed as an authenticator here. So password is not in the sign-on, it is in the authenticators. And uh, you can obviously define the password policy by looking at the different the policy here, and you can specify the, the constraint you want on the different passwords. So these are the authenticators. Uh, there's a plethora here. Uh, you can add actually more. We support many other uh, authenticators, Duo Security. You can even create your own custom uh, Okta Verify if you want. So you can add authenticators uh, depending on the requirements of your organization. 
Once you have authenticators, a uh, thing that I explain is that every user that try to authenticate first go through the global session policy. So if we go to global session policy, you can see that we have two uh, policies that has been created for two different groups, as well as the default one. Um, and uh, if we look at the basic user, uh, you remember the basic user only required the password, so we can see that he requires a password. And you can see that now we also have the ability to delegate or to transfer at the level of the authentication policy. Now, by default, it's set up uh, here as a just uh, to mimic, to mirror what was in Classic here. And obviously, for the advanced user, uh, if we look at the policy, we will see our factor sequence here. So again, if you're using factor sequencing in Classic, you will find factor sequencing back in OIE. So these are global session policy. Uh, we also create, because there were sign-on rules at the level of the application, authentication policies for each of our application. So we can just briefly have a look at one here. So there is a rule that was, uh, that was, uh, that was uh, created here uh, for our uh, business insider application. And it is password plus another factor that has been uh, implemented here. And uh, that's the, 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 the fundamentals. Now, remember that those authentication policies are defined here in authentication policies, and then they are attached to uh, applications. So you can have several applications that use the same rule. Uh, there's a classic migrated, which is created for all applications that didn't have any, uh, any specific rule in classic. And uh, this is specifically important because the dashboard, for instance, will usually be attached to the, the classic migrated. Um, so that's uh, the, the fundamentals. So we've seen uh, where authenticators go, the global session policy, the authentication policy. The last thing I want to talk about very briefly, because you are going to see that uh, being illustrated in the rest of the webinar, is what is related to uh, the broad device context and specifically device assurance here. So device assurance are policies that can be created by platform. Uh, John will show you a more detailed example for Windows, but there is one that was created here uh, for iOS devices requiring a certain level of DOS. The password must be uh, must be set, touch ID, and the device must be jailbroken. Those conditions are dependent on the OS, so you have to look at all the different OSs for that. So again, you will hear much more about assurance policy a little later. And device integration, same thing. Uh, now, device integration, we had device trust in Classic, so this has been migrated as window legacy device trust configuration. Uh, but we can also, we will show during the demo how to add uh, Microsoft Intune, and that will be uh, again in John demo. So that's a brief overview of, um, of uh, before and after um, uh, the upgrade. So you can see a little bit of differences and hopefully that uh, illustrated the, um, the new concept that I just introduced. Thanks, Dimitri. And now that we understand some of the fundamentals of OIE, let's dive into device context in OIE. Uh, there are a number of new features, uh, the devices, uh, related features that are exposed in OIE, some of which are native to Okta and some of which are available via third-party integrations. Um, out of the box, OIE provides uh, device registration via the Okta Verify app for both desktop devices now as well as mobile devices running Windows, Mac, iOS, or Android. The Okta Verify enrollment creates a, crypto back, uh, excuse me, a cryptographic binding between user and device, which can be protected by biometrics if available. And once enrolled, all of these devices are visible to administrators in Universal Directory in the Okta Admin Console. Okta Verify now also collects and checks device attributes and context by platform without any MDM integration required. Um, also, via third-party integrations, uh, you can uh, integrate uh, device management solutions, so MDMs, for additional security or, or for additional security signals. You can also integrate uh, endpoint security integrations. Now, all of this feeds into uh, device assurance policies, which can then be applied to device context aware authentication policies in Okta. So let's take a look at device registration in OIE. So again, as I mentioned, you can register natively with Okta Verify with no MDM solution required. Once Okta Verify is installed and enrolled, the devices will appear in Universal Directory and can be activated, deactivated, suspended, or deleted by administrators. Uh, obviously, for the administrators, the benefits here are additional visibility into the user and device bindings, 
uh, as well as attributes of specific devices. So operating system version, disk encryption status, jailbreak status, et cetera, as well as giving the admin the ability to deactivate and remote sign out devices. Now let's, sorry, uh, let's take a look at how uh, this Octa, or excuse me, how this user and device binding is established during the Octa Verify enrollment. So for this example, we're going to take a look at FastPass on a desktop device. Um, before using FastPass for authentication, you have to go through an enrollment process to enroll your device into Octa FastPass. Now, there are multiple ways that this can happen, but for this example, we're going to look at a use case where our end user, Dimitri, has received a laptop from his company that he just joined. And he's going to need to ins either install the OctaVerify app on the desktop, or it could have been pre-installed by administrators, and then initiate a FastPass enrollment process by clicking get st the Get Started button. He's going to be asked to authenticate against his company's Okta tenant with other factors that have been previously set up, such as a password or email magic link or SMS OTP. Um, after authenticating to the Okta org, Dimitri can then complete the enrollment process by providing biometrics such as face ID or uh, fingerprint scan. And once this is done, Dimitri is all set. His laptop is now registered against his Okta org, his company's Okta org, and can now be used as a possession authenticator in Okta. Now, behind the scenes, FastPass has created a cryptographic key pair. It stores that private key securely in the device's trusted platform module. And it sends the public keys to the Okta backend. Okta's backend securely stores the device information and the public key to complete the enrollment. So let's take a look at how this process aligns with uh, some NIST guidelines for phishing resistant authenticators. So first off, FastPass, as I mentioned, generates a strong public-private key pair using either ES-256 or RS-256 cryptographic algorithms that are backed by the end user's biometrics. So this satisfies the cryptographic binding between authenticator and user identity requirement of NIST. Additionally, the private key that's generated in this process never leaves the device. Also, uh, uh, FastPass is utilizing the TPM on the device when it's present. So this satisfies the high assurance and proof of possession requirements of NIST. Um, All right, so now let's take a look at a quick demo uh, of registration and register devices on Okta Verify. In this demo, we're going to take a look at device visibility in the Okta Admin Console. We'll look at some of the remote logout capabilities that are new to OIE, as well as look at some of the new data that's uh, available in the Okta System Log. For this demo, we're going to be using two different personas uh, to help us out here. On the left-hand side of the screen with the black background, we're, this is going to be our Okta Administrator persona. So we'll be in the Okta dashboard here. And on the right-hand side with the green background, this is going to be our end-user persona. Uh, in today's demo, we're going to be logging in using Okta FastPass that's already been installed and enrolled on this device, which is a MacBook uh, laptop. Now, if I go back into my admin console as my administrator and look under my universal directory, I can take a quick peek at the user who's going to be helping us out today, who's none other than Stetson Bennett, the mailman. Here we can see the applications that he has assigned. And now we also have this new devices section where we can see that Stetson has two different devices that have been registered. One is an iPhone and the other is this MacBook that we're going to be using for the demonstration today. Now, moving back over as my end user, I'm going to have Stetson sign in here using FastPass. So we click the button. We get prompted for biometrics. We provide our touch ID. And we are in. And you can see the familiar Okta dashboard with our applications assigned here, uh, which we can access immediately if we want. Um, now, let's imagine that Stetson has left for lunch and realized that he left his, lap his laptop at the office unattended, being the security conscious employee that he is. He calls in to the admin to let the admin know that the device has been left unattended. Now, the admin has a number of options as far as how to handle the situation. First thing is that we want to make sure that we 
get rid of any active sessions uh, that that the user may have so we can clear our user sessions here now when we do this this is going to uh, sign out uh, Stetson from any active session across all devices this will also revoke any refresh tokens that may be out there so it will force any OIDC or OAuth apps to re-authenticate once I do this I see that when I try to access applications I'm no longer able to because my session has been revoked uh, similarly if I try to do anything within the console itself like go to my settings I can see that I no longer have an active session here so that's good my session's been cleared uh, but I do still have FastPass installed on this machine which means that this laptop itself can be used as a possession factor for authentication so I need to do something about this device specifically so if I go back as my admin and take a look at this device I've got a couple of options here I can suspend or deactivate now in this case Stetson's just out to lunch briefly so let's just start by suspending access to that particular device so I'm going to suspend and now if I come back in and someone maybe walks by Stetson's laptop and tries to log in they get prompted but this time you'll see that we get an error which says that the device itself has been invalidated or this authenticator on that device has been invalidated so we're not able to log in with this device as a uh, possession factor for authentication anymore now once Stetson gets back from lunch he can go find the admin and show him that he has his MacBook now securely in hand uh, and as the administrator I can now unsuspend this device to restore access to sign in with FastPass so once he's back we can log in prompt for biometrics and now we're back in access has been restored now in some scenarios we may want to actually require our end user to re-enroll uh, in uh, in OctaVerify to re-establish that binding between user and device um, in this case what we could do is deactivate rather than just suspend so initial steps will be the same as before we want to make sure we clear all of the sessions that may have been active um, but this time rather than simply suspending access which can be restored without re-enrollment uh, required this time we're going to actually deactivate the, the device and the key distinction here again is that this will require the user to re-enroll um, re and re-authenticate with the device prior to restoring access so once again we'll try to log in using FastPass on the device and just like before this fails and we get the same error message uh, the device has been invalidated and we cannot use it as an authenticator uh, to log into our Okta account now again uh, this is very similar to before the key difference being that this deactivate function will require a re-authentication and re-enrollment now while we have deactivated FastPass on this device and we can no longer use the device itself as an authenticator we are still able to authenticate from this device using other authenticators so I can still log into my dashboard using a pass password and depending on the specific app level authentication policy of the applications I can still access certain applications this one only requires a password for example this one is going to require a password plus one additional factor now I do still have Okta Verify installed on another device I have it installed on my iPhone so I'm still able to use the code from Okta Verify from my iPhone to satisfy the additional factor for this application's policy. Uh, so once I get my once I get my code, I'll put this in here, and we'll see that we can access this, app, this application. Now you'll notice on the next application, the third application, it's a little different. The third application is going to require a phishing resistant factor, which I no longer have uh, because I have deactivated FastPass. So this one gets denied and I'm unable to log in until I re-enroll in FastPass now I want to switch gears a little bit let's go back into our Okta administrator persona and I want to take a look at the system log entry from our login to Okta with FastPass and if I expand this entry you'll notice that we now have in OIE some additional syslog data we have this new device section that's pulling in data uh, first of all it's pulling in data from our device integrator but also has data that's available natively just through Okta Verify uh, about the, the device itself all this data is available not only from 
or for use with device assurance policies, which you'll see more of here in just a little bit. Um, but you can also access it directly here from the system log. So you can use it for things just such as simple auditing purposes or potentially in conjunction with a third party uh, SIM integration, you could use this to trigger various sorts of workflows based on the information in these logs. So a lot of good data that's captured here in the system log. All right, now that we've taken a look at device registration, let's take a deeper dive into device assurance. And for that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Dimitri. Actually, I'm gonna turn that over to, not Dimitri, but to John. Let me, uh, how do I get out of this screen here? And uh, John, you can take it away from here. Thanks, Brent. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm just gonna go over a few things here with device integrations. And the, the first one being um, managed devices in OIE. And uh, everyone is probably aware of this by uh, the classic name of device trust. Uh, we, do, we do call this managed devices now. Um, using managed devices, it allows the admin to enforce a company owned device on application access. Right. Um, in Okta Classic, this um, this was enforced with a certificate that was issued by the Okta CA. There were some scripts or agents that were running on all of those machines. We still have the Okta CA available. It does work a little differently. Um, now we use Skep instead, um, or you can use your own uh, certificate authority if you'd rather manage those certificates on your own. Um, the thing to note is that any um, anything to do with devices, oh, oh wait, where? oh yeah, anything to do with devices um, in those app, in those authentication policies does require Octa Verify. So Octa Verify is required in order to obtain any information from that device. Um, some other things that we can do with those device integrations, um, we can strengthen the uh, your application access by enforcing certain endpoint configurations on the device. Um, and then we can make device context aware policies so that you could you know, maybe enforce lighter requirements on a company managed device and maybe stronger requirements or deny access altogether on non company managed devices. Next slide. So um, when we talk about managed devices in OIE, um, we're really vendor agnostic now. Um, you know, we, we do include some of the uh, bigger MDM solutions and some walkthroughs of those solutions on the Help Center. Um, for a Windows and Mac OS, any MDM solution that supports uh, deploying a SCEP profile to the device is supported with Okta. Um, the dependency on Active Directory for Windows, uh, Windows device trust or managed devices is gone. And like I said before, you can bring your own certificate authority. Uh, we have lots of customers that like to use maybe ADCS or they manage their own certificate environment. You can continue to do that, or you can use the built-in provided Okta CA. Uh, mobile devices, in order to be supported for mobile devices, the only requirement on the MDM is that the solution supports pushing a managed app, Okta Verify in this instance, to the device and managing the um, the secret key on each device. So endpoint detection and response or EDR, um, we can do lightweight device checks, no need for an MDM to do um, those EDR detections today. The only integrations that are supported are CrowdStrike for Windows and Mac OS and also Windows Security Center. So if we flip to the next, we'll, we'll run through a demo, uh, quick setting up Microsoft Endpoint Manager, maybe you know it is Intune, and enrolling a device um, using Intune. So go ahead and play the demo, Brent. All right, so the first thing, um, we're just gonna follow along the Help Center documentation um, that's out there. The first step would be to create the app registration in Azure AD and generate the credentials and assign the permissions for that app. So we've created the app registration. We'll now go into the secrets. We're going to generate a new secret. Uh, you can pick the validity, make sure you keep that 
in hand so you can refresh it if need be. Um, and then you're going to just take note of the key that's generated because you won't be able to see it again. So we'll copy that out. And then we're going to add the permissions uh, for the API so that Okta can access this app. Like I said, all this is spelled in the documentation. We're going to add a SCAP profile permission to that app registration first. And then next, we'll add the user read permissions for, for the app or for the Microsoft Graph, sorry. So once we're done creating this, we're going to notice that in the window behind it that we will get a warning telling us that um, these permissions are not yet consented to by the admin. So after we add them both, there's an option in the UI. We're going to make sure to grant admin consent. And then we're good. So we'll flip over to the overview and we're going to take note of the application ID. So we're going to copy, save that off for use in a minute inside of Okta. We also need the tenant ID um, on this same screen. So we're going to copy that out save that to be used late in the next steps in Okta. So the next step, we're going to flip over to the Okta admin console, and we're going to go to security and device integrations. Once here, we can add the platform for desktop, Windows, and Mac OS. We're going to select dynamic skip for Intune. We're going to paste our values. We have the tenant ID. We have the client ID and the secret from the steps that we just created. Once we have all three of those values, we can generate the SCEP URL for this org, and we're going to copy that out, and we're going to note that down for use in the next step. So now we flip back over, or we're going, we need to go to the certificate authority, and we're going to download this certificate so that we can use it in the next step, and then while we're here, we're going to go to the endpoint security and we're going to enable CrowdStrike for Mac OS and Windows. And we're also going to enable the Windows Security Center. And then we'll flip over to Intune. And we're going to go to devices in, inside of Intune and we're going to create two device configuration policies. The first policy being the trusted certificate that we just downloaded from Okta, that's for the Okta CA. Oops, not skip, but trusted, sorry. And it will ask us, we'll give it a name that makes sense, and then it's gonna ask us to upload the certificate, which we do in the next step, and then we'll better to move on. So this, this trusted certificate will be used in the next device config policy for the next profile. So we get it uploaded. And then we're going to place that in the computer intermediate store on all the devices. Uh, the next thing, we just need a group or users or devices, however you manage your access to those profiles within um, MEM or Intune. We just have a group here. We're going to select that. And we're done. So the next step, we're going to create the SCEP profile. Uh, the settings for this profile are uh, spelled out in the Help Center documents. You'll see some of the common configurations that um, I like to use. Give it a name that makes sense again. And on this step, I like to generate a subject name for this certificate, something that um, if me as an admin are trying to troubleshoot on the device, I can quickly look at it, see that it came from Okta, and know which certificate this is. So we're generating user certificates. Uh, we give you a, an example. I like to include the Okta org so I know where it came from. You can uh, do however you'd like. And then we're going to scroll through the validity period. We're going to select a year. The key storage, we're going to try to store in the TPM if possible. It's used for digital signature. The key size is 2048. And the hash algorithm is SHA-2. 
we're going to select the trusted root cert that we just created in the other profile. And we're going to pick client off from the EKU. The other SCEP server URL that we got from Okta, we're going to paste that URL here and save that. Now that we have this, the next step, we're going to flip over to our, oh, sorry, same group that we had before. After this is created, we'll flip back over to the uh, Windows machine that we're using. <clears throat> and you'll see that these certificates are indeed installed. So first we'll check the intermediate certs. They are called Organization Intermediate Authority is the name of the certificate you're looking for. Those are Okta CA certs. And then in the personal store, you'll see the actual certificate for the user prefaced with the org name like I typed in the profile just before. That makes it easy to see. Cool. So next slide. So we showed how to set up that integration with Intune in this example. Obviously, like I said, um, it's you know, we support more than just Intune. So just using this as a reference starting point. And then the next thing we need to do is actually create an authentication policy. So in this authentication policy, we can um, select options of the device state is, it's registered, meaning that there is an account on the registered to Okta Verify on that device. And then we can choose whether the device needs to be managed or not. Um, if you want to allow both, you're going to need a policy for each one. Um, you know, for the purpose of our example, we're only going to allow managed devices. So um, in my example, you'll see I select the managed. Um, the device assurance policy, which we'll cover in a bit. Um, the platform you could specify if it's Windows, Mac OS, Chrome, iOS device, Android, um, any number of options. And then you can use the custom expressions for um, those EDR signals that we had set up previously. Next slide. So on those device assurance policies, we talked um, a little bit about configuring that assurance policy. What these are, these are lightweight checks that we can use Okta Verify to query the health of the device. So um, in this example that we have on the screen here, you can see that we have an iOS policy. Uh, we want it to be at least iOS 16. You have to have a password, you have to have touch ID, and the device cannot be jailbroken. So once we apply this to a policy, we can enforce these settings on the end user's device before they're allowed access to the application. All right, next slide. The next step in the policy is the, um, the EDR signals that we're getting. And you saw from Brent's example before, in the system log, you see all of the signals that were collected. Um, some common ones here, um, maybe we want to check and make sure that antivirus is running on the device. So we can query the and uh, say that the criteria for accessing this app or you know, this rule on this app says the Windows Security Center antivirus is in good standing. Um, other signals that you can get, you get the ZTA score. Um, not a super crowd strike person, but uh, those are the different attributes that we get generated in that file for the users. Other Microsoft Security Center antivirus firewall auto update settings um, are supported as well. OK, next slide. All right, so here we'll, we'll set up the authentication policies. We'll add the custom expressions, and we'll demonstrate the end user experience. So let's flip through the demo. So we have a Salesforce application here that we want to allow only company managed devices to access the app. First thing we need to do on a newly upgraded org, FastPass will not be enabled, so you need to enable FastPass. I've chosen to enable the option on the login screen. You do not have to do that if you don't want. Um, we'll go ahead and save that. And then we're going to flip over to the device assurance policies where you see we've already started with the shell of a Windows policy. We're going to enforce on Windows machines using Octa Verify that Windows Hello must be enabled in order to access this application. So you can also decide if you want to display the end user remediation for that 
error message when the user gets an access denied. That was the option on the previous screen. So here we have our managed devices authentication policy. We are going to look at the rule to allow managed devices only. We've selected registered, managed. We want to enforce our device assurance policy. So the Windows devices we just created enforcing Windows Hello. And then we have custom expressions. We want to enforce that all the Windows Security Center is in good standing. So we're going to put all of the different signals and make sure they're all good. We're going to allow any two factors, phone not allowed, and re-authenticate after two hours. The catch-all rule will be denied since we want to allow only devices that meet all the criteria of rule one to access this application. So we're gonna, oh, forgot to assign it to the Salesforce app, need to do that. And then we're gonna flip over to our client to demonstrate how this works. So in order to collect any signals on the device, like I had mentioned before, we need a registered, an account registered to Okta Verify on the device. So I'm gonna just step you through. Um, you'll see the registration happening. My user, ask me my password. I do have OctaVerify installed on my mobile device, so it is going to force me to use the OTP in order to finish the registration on that device. Okay, so once we're enrolled, we can see the account. We're going to skip Windows Hello setup for now because we don't have Windows Hello set up. So now we are configured. We will try to access our application. You can see when this low is not there. And if we look at the device health, it tells us your device is no good because you don't have Windows. Hello. Now we'll flip back and we will try to access the application. So we'll hit to Salesforce. We will automatically query and use FastPass. And you can see that we tried to check and the device did not meet the security requirements dictating that Windows Hello be enabled on the device. So. The next thing we need to do is we need to go and enroll in Windows Hello. And as not to bore you with that, I've done that and skipped ahead. You can see me logging in with my pen now. And now we'll try to access the application. Knowing that we still haven't enabled Windows Hello on the actual account, but Windows Hello is enabled on the device, which is the requirement. So now we'll try to access the application again. And yes, it's me. And I need my password because my FastPass only counts as one single authenticator. Now what we're going to do is we're going to actually go into the account on OctaVerify. We're going to enable Windows Hello on that account. It's going to ask us to authenticate again, just like we were enrolling. So we're gonna do our password, our OTP, and then Windows Hello will be enabled on our device or on our account on that device. So I need my pin to verify. Sorry, my VM only supports pin, no fingerprint or facial recognition. And now when we access the app, you'll see that password no longer required because we are using FastPass plus our pin. So we've done possession and knowledge all in one step and the user is granted access. Awesome. All right, now back to Brent. Sorry, I was on mute there. Thanks, John. Um, all right, so we have seen um, an example of registering devices in Okta uh, natively with Okta Verify. We've taken a look at some advanced device assurance policies that you can set up. And we've looked at some third-party integration tools. All this, again, is, is available to you uh, in Octa Identity Engine. Uh, so if you're not already on it, it's a great, great reason to upgrade. Speaking of that, uh, let's take a look at that process, what that looks like uh, to actually upgrade through the self-service upgrade tooling. Before I do that, however, I do want to call out some uh, additional resources that are available to you. Um, first of all, there is uh, an Octa Identity Engine hub that's available on our support site. And I'm actually going to throw all these links in the chat window here. Let me, sorry, let me just get out of this really quickly so I can throw this in the chat. 
if you take a quick look in the chat window, I'm going to post a handful of links here. Um, thanks. Where did my what's going on here? Do a new share here. Sorry. There we go. All right. So those uh, links should be now in the in the chat window. Um, as I said, we do have an OIE hub on our support site that's sort of the uh, one-stop shop for all sorts of documentation around uh, Okta Identity Engine uh, and as well as the upgrade process from Classic to, to Identity Engine. Um, also, I, I want to call your attention to a uh, discussion group that we have on our community site. It's the Okta Identity Engine plus Office Hours discussion group. Uh, if you're not already, I, I highly recommend that you suggest that you request membership in that group. Uh, from there, you can uh, register for one-on-one -on -one, uh, office hour sessions. So if you have any any questions around OIE or the upgrade process, you can register for either one-on-one -on -one sessions or group sessions to ask questions there. Um, and finally, I want to uh, call out that we have upcoming on Thursday of this week, uh, and ask me anything session on our support site uh, specific to Okta Identity Engine. So um, for any of you who are like, if we are not able to get to some of the questions that are asked today, or if you think of questions after after you leave the meeting today, feel free to uh, check that link that I posted in the, the chat window for the ask me anything. The form is open now, so you can begin submitting your questions currently. And we'll have a live answer session on Thursday, uh, I believe, uh, 9 a.m. Eastern to, or sorry, 10 a.m. Eastern to noon Eastern, so 7 Pacific to 9 Pacific. Uh, and that that site will remain up so that you can uh, check the responses after the fact as well if you're not able to make it during that window. But any questions that don't get uh, responded to today on the, on the uh, Zoom Q&A, we will post those into that forum as well. So you can check that forum to see the responses to any questions that we're not able to get to in our allotted time today. All right. So with that, let's take a look at the upgrade process uh, from Classic to OIE. So uh, there is now self-service tooling that is available for most, most orgs. There may be some orgs out there that still have uh, some configuration changes that are required that uh, that make them ineligible for this tooling. So uh, currently, but many of you may already see this this tooling available to you. Um, this basically allows you to uh, schedule your own upgrade after either completing some um, some required eligibility steps or acknowledging some some consent items. So the first thing to note is that you do have to log in as a super admin. Only the super admins will have this ability. So no other level of admin can upgrade your org. So if you're if you're if you don't commonly log in as a super admin, you may not see this. So you may want to log in as your super account just so that you can verify whether or not you've got the tooling available to you. Um, the uh, schedule upgrade button. Uh, is just the start of the process. It, there is no such thing as an upgrade now. So you're, there's no danger of accidentally clicking a button and kicking off an upgrade until you're ready. Uh, the only thing that you can do is schedule an upgrade and the upgrades can be scheduled a minimum of two hours out into the future. So uh, no need to be frightened of clicking the wrong button. There's, there's always some buffer built in there. Um, also all admins, uh, once the upgrade has been scheduled. All the admins in your tenant will receive notifications of that, uh, along with the date and time of the upgrade, uh, of the scheduled upgrade. So the first step is to check your eligibility requirements. Uh, so to do that, you just click the Get Started button. And depending on the specifics of your tenant, you'll be presented with uh, you know, possibly more, possibly less than uh, the, the items that you see here. 
So there are basically are two categories of, of items that you may be presented with. One is simply acknowledgement items. So these are things that are just warnings. Uh, there will be links to documentation to each specific item that you should review um, and, and just validate in your own environment whether uh, this is going to be an issue for you. It, it, a warning will not stop you from upgrading as long as you uh, acknowledge it, but it's just a call out that there may be some issues and you, you need to do a little additional research and potentially some additional testing in a non-prod environment before you, before you upgrade. Uh, the other category are actual configuration items that need to be completed. These would be things that cannot, uh, that would not allow the upgrade to proceed until you actually make the prescribed configuration changes. And again, as, as with the warnings, there are uh, call outs for each individual item, along with documentation for each individual item on how, how to remediate those, those items. Once you've uh, acknowledged, uh, or once you've completed all the configuration items and you've acknowledged all of the warnings, the next step is to schedule your upgrade. Um, so for that, you just choose your date and time. And that's it, you're done. Uh, so at, at that point, your upgrade is scheduled. If you need to adjust that time, you can do that uh, by going back to the same tooling in your dashboard and, and uh, adjust the date and time. Uh, the acceptable range is from anywhere from two hours out up to 30 days out into the future. If for some reason you needed to cancel the upgrade altogether, you could do that through a support ticket. Um, now, if uh, something happens between the time that you schedule your upgrade and the time that the upgrade would actually execute, that would um, prevent the upgrade from taking place. So for example, if there is a configuration change that happens in between that time, uh, that introduces a blocker for upgrading. So um, you know something that would not allow your, your work to upgrade, uh, you will see that noted here in the self-service tooling. So you, you will see a notification uh, that shows that a configuration change has been required. Once that change has either been reverted or, or remediated in some form to remove the blocker, at that point, you will be able to proceed uh, with the upgrade once again. And that's it. Once your upgrade is complete, you'll see a notification like this at the top of your admin dashboard. You'll also get uh, email notifications. All of your admins will get email notifications that the upgrade has been completed. So just to recap uh, what we've discussed today, we started with a simple Okta Classic org, uh, reviewed some key OIE new concepts and took a look at the before and after states, uh, before and after upgrade. Uh, we dove into some new device context capabilities in OIE. And finally, we walked through the upgrade process itself through the self-service tooling. Uh, again, just to reiterate, uh, the additional resources that are available to you, I, I highly recommend that you bookmark these. Again, the links to, to this should all be in the uh, chat window. And uh, included in that is a link to the um, OIE playlist on Okta's YouTube channel, where you'll find the recording for this webinar and all the webinars in the series, as well as some other helpful uh, content uh, that it's, that's OIE related on that channel. And finally, uh, mark your calendars. As I, I mentioned earlier, we do have an Ask Me Anything that's coming up uh, on Thursday. Uh, again, the link is in the chat window. That's this Thursday, the 24th from 7 to 9 Pacific, 10 to noon Eastern. Um, any questions that we uh, that we don't get to from this forum, we will post those in that forum along with responses. And again, uh, if you have other questions about anything you've heard today or, or anything at all uh, OIE related, feel free to, to post them to that forum. And also um, be on the lookout on September 26 for the next webinar in this series. Uh, it'll be September 26, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. And the topic is going to be most likely zero trust use cases. So 
mark your calendars for that. We will be sending out notifications for that either through your account teams or through the uh, discussion group that is uh, noted in the chat window. Um, so keep your keep your eyes open for that as well. 